Hey, you guys, we are going live and it is episode four of the Fourfold Formula mini series. Welcome to Netflix. No, I'm just kidding. Mark Zuckerberg did not be pissed that I said Netflix. Christine's in the house and she knows how Mark Zuckerberg loves me. She's shaking her head. She's down there in the green room. I've got Marcus Vetstein, my co-author in the green room as well. And we've got Dr. Sharon Martin here. These guys are going to co-host. We're going to talk about their stories from the fourfold formula for all things wellness, which is just like a tongue tying thing that I want you to say three times after you've had 12 beers. <sighs> all right. We got some giveaways. We're going to get some call to actions from these beautiful ladies. So we're going to get started. Let me bring in my, um, my, uh, Robin to my Batman, my Batman. I'm your Robin and you're my Batman. Hi, buddy. Look at you. You're all, you're going to, we're going to do, be playing the mute game tonight. How are you, Mark? I got it. I turned it on. <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> Don't touch my buttons. <laughs> How are you tonight? Pushing my buttons again, huh? <laughs> uh, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Yes, yes. It's been a good weekend. We're looking forward to uh, work week. So um, we're in good spirits. No one ever said they're looking for their work week. <laughs> I was so excited mm -hmm. for my work week. After, right, after, got, after two weeks off, it's okay. <laughs> we got to go save lives being the you know best endocrinologist from Denver to Salt Lake City. I mean, hey, that's you. Mm. You're a big deal. Okay. Thank you. Thank right. you for that. <laughs> All right. Let's bring Christine in the house. Christine. Oh, there you are. Hello. We're going to bring in the next beautiful movie star. Hi, Dr. Sharon. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How are you ladies doing Sunday night? Thanks for partying. You're missing like NFL football games. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Oh, I'm okay with that. I always jump in at the end. <laughs> we're DVRing <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, you guys, we're both authors in this 40. It ended up being 40 authors in this compilation, this multi-author book that we did. And it, it's been quite a, quite a nine months, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Sharon, you're a radio host and you're a physician and you are an intuitive and you, you're an author. You've written before, right? Yes. What has this been like for you? It's exciting because what I love is the people coming together with heart energy. And that, that kind of stuff is what changes the world. So I'm all for it. That's kind of been your path for in, in your story, which I want you to give us a kind of a synopsis of your story in a second. But you, Marcus and I came from like a real strong Western medicine ground, yeah. playground. And you, of course, have played around for a few decades in internal medicine. And you've got that beautiful shift in your story of listening to whispers that I want you to talk about and really shifting to heart center and listening to your intuition and, and all of that fun stuff. What Marcus, what did you go ahead, Sharon? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So I think the thing that struck me when I was writing that was just reflecting on and probably so many of us have this where you grow up in a household and there's conditioning and there's rules and there's, ways of doing things that really squelch you. And I never really had faith. I had worry. I had apprehension. I had hypervigilance. And when I started studying shamanism and energy medicine, and I started feeling the unseen world, the big forces of the galaxy and of the earth, I literally developed faith and that's an amazing thing so listening listening my stories about listening to the whispers of spirit because it's always there a little nudge if you really listen it becomes a louder voice but the message i really have for myself and for others is we are supported all around us often by what we cannot see so I'm all for it. I love that. You're still practicing internal medicine, right? Yes. Oh my gosh. Has it changed your practice? Marcus, can you, I want to bring you into this conversation. What, what are your 
thoughts because I've managed your clinic of which you're an endocrinologist and we had an internist in the office and we had an infectious disease. So we danced around kind of these specialties. What are your thoughts with what Sharon's done and how she's integrating her shamanism kind of in her practice? Yeah, I think there's a lot to be done, you know, with regards to interfacing it, it's kind of difficult because when you're in a clinic environment, you have to, you know, obey, obey the AMA rules and all these kind of things that, um, so you can approach patients individually and that's the art of medicine right there, right? And so I think from a perspective of, uh, what's going on, and I don't know how long Sharon that has has been doing this, is you integrate this into your practice as part of your uh, way of getting to information that other practitioners don't get to that might lead you to a diagnosis that gives your uh, patients uh, a better outcome faster or whatever. So, so it's definitely integratable, but not on the, on the big scale, let's put it this way, and I need to do that one-on-one. -on -one. And I so think, I think that Sharon probably changes, doing the same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> it Sorry. changes how you think. And when it changes how you think and you're able to see possibilities, it changes the way you talk to a person. Um, you don't have that absolute that they're going down this path of a horrible diagnosis. You're able to see alternate destinies. It just shifts your whole perspective. And you're right, you don't have time to actually do shamanic rituals in a clinic setting, but the way you think about it. it does, it's not like you have to sit down with this huge PowerPoint. You're still doing your magic without, you know, the presentation of your magic. Hey, Christine, um, join the party. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So you guys, um, very different stories very different stories. Um, you know, Sharon is really about listening to the whispers and just how they guided her. You guys, for decades, Sharon had these messages and intuition and just red flags and detours in the road that took you to a certain place. And again, if you guys want to read all these stories, get your book on amazon.com, The Fourfold Formula. Christine, can you tell us about your story in the book? I wrote about being my mother's guardian. She was, I don't remember a time when my mother wasn't ill. She um, had Huntington's disease. And so my story is just about growing up with that um, and the family dynamic, the entire family. Um, there were 12 of us and only two of us didn't get it um, in my generation. Um, it, but mostly it was about making decisions. I became her guardian when she was, when I was 18. And so I was still a child and I had to make my own decisions and hers, but we never got to talk about end of life. She was sick when I was a child. I wouldn't have understood that. And so I had to make those decisions for her. I, I used how I would feel, how my quality, what I would feel about my quality of life is how I had to base making the choices for her. So. And I chose to stop all treatment and let her die, but it took rather longer than we all thought. So, it, you know, it ends with that, the, the experience, the actual experience of her dying. So. I love, I love hearing your voice when you talk about that because there's so much courage, but founded in love and respect. Um, that's a horrible disease. And to know horrible. when you finally learn how dominant in transmission it is, and then you were only two out of 12 who didn't get it, that's that's a whole dynamic. So yeah. more power to you. Yes, and then the fact that, um, you know, it is a, a very long-term disease, uh, clinically yeah. speaking, you know, it does wear down on people a lot over the time that it takes for this whole thing to unfold. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for people that have taken care of cancer patients, they know how intense the work is. 
um, I think about the years leading up to that before for care already. That's tremendous. And that's really um, amazing. And there are not many people that can muster the energy. And I hope they will find through your words that it is possible. You just have to work with it. So, right. Um, yeah, and that was really, I, I thought that was brilliant and marvelous. Oh, Thank fantastic. you. Yeah, we all, um, sorry if you guys, if we get some reverb for your ears, we apologize. We're trying, um, you know, we keep seeing all these stories came into, they came into Marcus and myself on the front line and each of them affected both of us differently. As much as we are, we are close, the stories affected us very differently. And Christine's was the first one that I lost it. Like I had my left brain doing its work, reading, doing all the, the good old editing and proofreading that you do and going back and forth and kind of almost coaching and helping people work through peeling back the onion. But when I got Christine's, my, my mom had just passed of MS in August. And believe it or not, Christine and I went to high school together and in the same town and I did not know this of her story. And when I read her story and going through what I just went through and how you were so transparent, so honest, so responsible, such a big girl at such a young age, and how you just spun it into something positive and did what you just did what you had to do. Yours was the first story I had to walk away from my computer. I literally had, I know exactly where I was sitting and that I had to walk away. So it, it, stories affect everybody and you don't, you don't necessarily know. Yeah. I, a lot of times I have people ask, you know, how did you do it? Or even why did you do it? I, and I, my only answer I can find is I grew up on a dairy farm <laughs> and you just had to get up. You had to do what you had to do every day. It wasn't like you could, I'm not really feeling your psychosis right now. I'm going to go take, you know, you couldn't do that. She didn't have anybody else. So, right. Um, I mean, she did, she had her mom and stuff, but her mom was elderly. But I think that I just treated it kind of like working on the farm. I just get up every day and did what I could each day without having a breakdown. And, you know, I could always sense it was coming, you know, like you're too much. And then I would back away and we'd maybe have a couple of weeks where we didn't have her at our house or something. But you still have to do what you have to do. So I, I, there's no magic to what I did. That's just what I had to do. Oh, man. Marcus, what are your thoughts? Well, like I said, it is very, um, very impact rich to realize that that is possible for some people who are just in agony from the chronicity of it all and the, and, and the acceleration. It just gets worse and worse and worse, you know, and so there is no turning back. There is no relief. Um, timeouts, like, like you mentioned, are very helpful, but the sheer amount of energy spent in something like this is is tremendous and so kudos it's all i can say it's it's amazing that you were able to hang in there for all that time <clears throat> you're muted Muting is always, I know, when I'm muted, it's always like a, it's a gift. It's a gift to the universe. I was going to say, yes, I'm going to take over. I would, <laughs> I would love more than anything for you to take over me. You have no idea. Thank you, Jesus. My great prayers have been answered. I was thinking about Sharon because um, some of us just don't listen to our intuition. And we go a year 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Did you know where you would end up long, long ago? And what was that? What, tell me what some of the whispers were. 
See, and this is what we're doing we're in this game. I always wanted to be a veterinarian and um, my father made a lot of decisions for me by the time I went to college. So I couldn't go to Kansas State, which I wanted to. I ended up in Connecticut and then this and then that. And then just by little, I always say that spirit kind of puts the, the roadblocks and puts the detours and you end up somewhere that turns out to be really rich and amazing. And on the other hand, I could see people would say, well, you dig in and you make the most of it. And that's why it turns out so well, because you really give it your best. But I do think for me anyway, my philosophical beliefs were being steered by something bigger than our human mind. So. So where did you end up as far as wanting to be a veterinarian in these, this little direction that you took. Tell us, tell us where you are and what your practice and what you're doing now and how fulfilled you feel. Well, on the way from veterinary, no veterinary, I ended up in graduate school and then I was teaching at Emory university. And then I just said, you know, this grant writing world is so, it has no juice for me. I said, I want to hang a shingle. I'm like, what am I talking about? I've never lived in the country in my life. <laughs> I'm a city girl. And um, a friend of mine said, why don't you apply to medical school? So I did. And then I took a job in a rural outback of South Central Pennsylvania. And I've been here 22 years. And it's, I don't mean this in a negative sense when I say it's a lot like veterinary medicine I would have imagined to be because you dig in and you handle the basics and there's no, you're not all spun around by fluff or, or mm -hmm. drama, you've got just basic people with basic real needs who never understood what sugar or high blood pressure were or never never had care on the basics. So it's sort of, that's very rewarding. I like that a lot. Oh my God. That's a great analogy. Seriously. That's getting down, getting down to the basics kind of reminds me of Christine who runs a daycare. Just get down to, just get down to those basics, right? Christine. Dirty. <laughs> Tell everybody what you do during the day. Oh my gosh. Seriously. I do. I run a preschool daycare. Well, infants to preschool. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I think I was on that crazy train ride taking care. Of, I think I, I, I needed that afterwards. I needed the, the innocence of children, the way they see the world. Um, I did it because my children also, I, I had a son who didn't want to sit down and pay attention in school. So I thought I can make him pay attention. <laughs> So I took him out of school and homeschooled him. But then I, I really think what drew me to it the most is the innocence that children, everything makes children happy. Even, you know, I have one little boy's family's going through a divorce. Even though that's very hard for him, he still comes here and he thinks my granddaughter is wonderful and he gets right down on the floor. She's one and plays with her in the morning. It just makes his whole day. And I thought if we could all take a page out of that book, you know, or just having the worst day of our lives. And maybe we need to get down on the floor and play with Peppa Pig. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but their resilience, little kids' resilience to, to all of those things. But mostly it's their happiness when I do things outside with them, like the clouds and the blowing the dandelion seeds. I think I probably need that more than they need. <laughs> but That's what writing does, though. I I. I love, you've been blogging for me also. That's how this kind of all started. This writing thing is for a couple of years. And, yep. um, you know, you were writing in the back room with a desire to someday write a book and you didn't really know what that looked like, but you did really, that was kind of your self care, which is really cool. You guys that seriously think about this. I mean, she really did do some dedicated of like, I'm going to go write for 30 minutes. This is my time. I'm going to kind of go do that. And you've done a, you did that. And then you started blogging and I have to tell you in watching your writing and I have told you this specifically watching your writing 
and the eloquence of, of how you have improved. But the content, <laughs> the content in and of itself has become more joyful and appreciative and childlike and innocent. You did. You talked about the shapes in the clouds and blowing the dandelion. Like you really have brought a lot of joy, honestly, to readers. But I think I did that. I think I needed it because it makes me happier. Even when I write it, I'm like, gosh, it makes me so happy. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Do you get that, Sharon? I know Marcus talks a lot about the catharticism of writing and how it can help heal. Do you feel that way when you write, Sharon? When I'm writing, if I start to get into the rhythm, and usually I'm connecting to something deeper inside me, some soul speak, so to, so to say, and then that's a feel good place. And then you're just riding that magic carpet of that feel good place. If for me, if I'm in alignment with what feels soul driven, those are magic moments. That's really cool. That's cool. It just carries you, it carries you into a different world of the way you feel. And then all of a sudden, as Christine says, your life is different because of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I've started to notice. You know, we talk all the time, but we were hoping that this book would give enough of a platform for all of us to try to help others with our story and that someone would connect. And, you know, I had someone a couple of years ago find me on LinkedIn that I just happened to share and this will resonate with you. I had just happened to pop up in a LinkedIn post about something about something. Can't even remember, but he was suicidal and he remembered my phone number from back in 2013 or 14. I was in his contact list and he texts me. It was Christmas a couple of years ago. And that's probably one of the top five examples I could give to someone that you don't know who's watching or reading or listening. The person who's on the couch who is having mental illness or the 11 year old whose parents have divorced that he doesn't realize the divorce rates. He's more like everybody than not like everybody. Mm -hmm. But um, writing is, you know, I've watched Marcus grow. I say that every show, I say that every time we get together and storytelling does that. And that's what we're hoping with, you know, book two and book three and book 89. It, it's just to give the community we built. I think you said something, Sharon, and I know Christine, you've noted, you're, you've seen different things that I've done. And this community was different because 40 people is different. 30 writers, human beings, getting to know each other and having each other's back and just like, let's, let's go. And we're there for each other. And that's what I'm the most proud of. Marcus, I thought you were going to run the damn show. Like, what are you doing sitting back like Rico Suave up there? I'm just <laughs> trying to work on my mic and you're messing with it again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I was going to say that, you know, uh, there's obviously different flavors for every personality and they all get expressed in these stories so well because people decided to, including myself, to be more open than is, I guess, um, socially, a social norm, right? I mean, usually people don't don't go that deep into themselves in public. <laughs> and, but the end result of that is that for me, it was really a just letting go and being able to finally say, yeah, now it's out there. So, you know, yes, I'm my own worst critic, but there will be plenty of others. So we'll see what comes of it. <laughs> And that is making you more lighthearted, more, you know, less, less depressed, more, I mean, you know, when we're talking frequencies, just a higher frequency, you feel more energetic, yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Sharon, when you think about your story, as we kind of come down around this bend here for tonight, when you think about your story and somebody who 
would really resonate with your particular story, what would you tell them to do? What kind of advice would you give them with what you learned? What would you say? I think it's a sort of a three step. We have to be more quiet and self-reflective and the second part is to be out in nature for me anyway i think that's a key place of finding spirit and our connection to the bigger world and then just listen you've really got to listen and you can hear amazing things and you'll get answers that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise oh man that's good you don't forget, put those three steps in the comment section. When we're done, we're live. I love that. That's that's really good. Christine, what about you? So, you know, you can't always control when somebody's family's got something in their family tree that you just, it is what it is. Yours was generational. You knew yep. the data. You knew it was, the odds were extremely high. I mean, it's not something you sit your six-year-old down and go, hey, by the way, odds are really shitty. This could happen, but... What would you say to somebody that kind of learns what you did at such a young age? Um, I think because I I was a young age, but I grew up with it. It was just so important that I know what it was, that I shared what it was. I tried to. Um, I told my kids when they were very young because I was right on that cusp and I didn't, I assumed that I didn't have it when I found out I was pregnant with my son, but it was years before I was actually sure. I wouldn't, I didn't carry the gene. And, and I told them that as soon as the test was more available, I would find out and tell them, but they knew from a very young age because they spent a lot of time with my mom. She came up and, mm. and it is, they're like, they're drunk. You know, they have lots of Karik movements and they slur their words. And, um, but both of my kids were able to, it's like they could communicate with their like uh, little children do and you don't understand what they're saying. Right. So they had a great relationship with her and they just would jabber in her language or theirs. I don't know which one it was, but I don't know. I, my thing was just to know what it is, except that the fact I knew she was going to die from it. She lived a very long time. She lived until she was 57. And I think that was her care in a nursing home environment. You know, she didn't have to do for herself. Mm. Um, so she lived much longer than her siblings, but. Uh, you have to accept that part. It, it's not one of those diseases that they're going to die. You know, they don't give you months. You know, they give you years, <laughs> decades. <laughs> um, and you just try to work around it. You try to, you have to know what the disease is so you can accept their limitations and your own. You have to be able to step back sometimes. I, I was able to when she was alive, but it was almost like when she died, it was almost, too much of a weight off my shoulders because I did have a nervous breakdown, but it, I waited until she passed. <laughs> that's, that's what happens that's while she was still alive. That's what um, happens. Yeah, it does. So and you got to take care of yourself and them. And I, I think I was just too young to understand that. Sometimes I was able to step back for a day or two. But wow. I think if I could look back now, I'd be like, oh, so many things I could have done differently for myself so that I didn't, you know, make it easier for her and myself. But yeah. <laughs> you did exactly what you were supposed to do in the time you did with the data that you had. And yeah, exactly. it was aligned. Yeah. Yep. What are some <laughs> final thoughts that you have, Mr. Vetstein, Dr. Vetstein? What are the final thoughts? Well, the final thoughts are that um, although both stories are quite different, um, we have basically an underlying openness that is the common theme to all of this. And that is basically, I think, from my perspective, what I experienced, the key to what I call the waking up, you know, where all of a sudden you start realizing, oh, things are maybe a little different than I thought and maybe I have to be a little bit more flexible and maybe I don't have to be so fearful of the unknown you know those type of things start popping in and you have to yeah. start being able to work with yourself to get to a better place basically and um, 
I think we all have done this, if not through our own story, then maybe through the story of others. And, and, and that is the component that I think is the, the most key portion. Book number one, let's wake up. <laughs> I, love I love it. Well, you guys, 30 minutes goes by really, really fast. And ladies, thank you for coming. And your stories are of a big asset to the book. I want everybody to go out, go on to amazon.com and grab the fourfold formula for all things wellness. And the second book we're recruiting right now for authors win the wellness war. So you can go to Peggy. You can email me at Peggy at allthingswellness.com or you can hop onto the website at allthingswellness.com. Thank you, Christine, so much for joining us. Thank you. Nice with you guys. What's that, Sharon? Nice being with you guys. Oh, it, it was really nice. Thank Happy you. Sunday night. I really appreciate you guys. You're amazing human beings. So Marcus, cool. until next time, America. No. <laughs> All right, you guys. Good night. Bye. Good night.